by subscribing and leaving comments. November 10th, 19, now let's finish with Patterson, one more, November 10th, 1995, I believe, uh, hard copy on Friday showed videotape of an alleged Bigfoot shot in Northern California. My initial reaction to the report was that it was bullshit. That's, I, I, saw, I saw the movie like everyone else, the short clip, I thought it was bullshit. So let me show the video clip and then comment. It's a very poor quality uh, tape. <clears throat> Maybe our tracking is off a little bit and we'll see very little. Tom, can you fast forward? No, no. Now, take it back and slow down. Back up a little. The object that you see there was apparently filmed August 28, 1995, at about 8.37. The object, this is the lady. This is the witness. That is one of the witnesses, by the way. She is Anna Marie Goddard. We can stop that video and pull it out. That's the motorhome that they got the videotape in. And some lights. Pull that videotape out and drop the next videotape in. So I thought to myself, well, that's, I looked at the video like everyone else did on hard copy. The videotape of the subject is just short, short of 30 seconds, about 27 seconds long. And I thought to my, my initial reaction was BS. I just purchased a motor home and I thought, well, let's take it for a test run. We may as well as go take a look at the Redwoods up in Northern California. I called Richard Greenwell. I asked him, where specifically is this, where did this incident happen? He told me specifically where it was. Richard Greenwell and Dr. Jeff Meldrum were interviewed on the hard copy piece investigating on the site. It is of no surprise that most of the people in the Bigfoot community think that this film is a fake. I thought the same thing. I get to the film site, I did some measurements, and just briefly to tighten up my presentation, it's my opinion, it's what I think I don't know, that the subject that's shown in this videotape August 28, 1995, in the Redwoods, maybe about 35 miles from the Patterson-Gimlin film site, depicts an animate object, a male specimen of a Bigfoot, as opposed to a man in a costume. I submitted a report to Fake Magazine and they published it. In there, you can read more about the findings about that. I did some crude experimentation on the film site with my tape measure, dropping it on the top of the RV, down to the side of the tree where the subject allegedly, not allegedly, we know for a fact, the subject went past a big redwood tree as a hallmark. At about eight feet two inches, there's a notch or a mossy thing that's discernible. We use that as a reference mark. My own crude estimates put the subject at about seven feet eight inches tall. 
Richard Greenwell and Jeff Meldrum did their own calculations on the film site, stating that the sub subject was in the area of about seven feet, six inches tall. That case is still open. The Bigfoot question is still open. We're still looking into it. But I wanted to show you the video for those of you who have not seen the videotape. One final thing. Can you show the next videotape? This videotape allegedly was made of the abominable snowman was shown on a program called Paranormal Borderline. It's said to be a dark creature in the snow. Cut. And again, the people, there's Jeff Meldrum, I don't know who this is, and I believe that's Richard Greenwell. And there's the subject. Where was that? Can you turn that one off, Tom? Unlike Roger Patterson's movie, we have a lot of information that we know where the film site was. We know a lot about the case with Roger Patterson. With this alleged movie of the Yeti or Abominable Snowman, we know very, very, we have very little information about the circumstances surrounding the videotape. I don't know if it's a fact, but I understand that Peter Byrne who's been to the Himalayas many, many times, like everyone else, saw the footage. And he said, that doesn't even look like the Himalayas. So, Byrne is not noted for being a highly reliable source, but I, said, I know that Byrne has been to the Himalayas, and I said, huh, when in doubt, throw it out. I've got some questions about this one. I can add a little addendum to that, if I may. Just in, Absolutely. Just in the last few weeks, uh, we showed the film to two of the main experts on Himalayan ecology, India, Tibet, Nepal, the whole area, and they stated that they're, they're certain that that was not taken in the Himalayas. It's in no area that the, they see the rock formations, the vegetation, even the consistency of the snow is not the Himalayas. So it's taken somewhere else, apparently. So, and apparently the claim is that the film was made in the Himalayas. No. The TV people, uh, first television, that did it for Paranormal Borderline, I mean for, for Paramount, said we think it's taken in the Himalayas. But as we've never been able to contact the witnesses directly, because they refuse to tell us who they are, we've no way to know what the witnesses claim, if anything. I see. So anyway, that is the videotape, and as you can see, there are questions as to who the, the, the cinematographer is and exactly where the film was made. One final point, and I will open up to questions. Uh, I, I just just admit, one quick little thing is that our calculations indicate eight to nine feet in height for that one. So that's a big subject, a very big subject. Uh, what was the one final thing? Oh, on the 25th anniversary of Roger Patterson's film, I put together this, I think it's a very definitive write-up on the scenario and the circumstances surrounding the film. It's called Bigfoot at Bluff Creek. It's available right outside the doors. The only thing that I'm still very curious to know about the film, like everyone else, is that nobody knows where the film was developed. Nobody can answer the question very effectively or firmly, where they think that the film may have been developed in Seattle. So if the people from the Seattle Times are in here, 
if they do a write-up, they should put that question out. The, we know the film was developed, but we don't know where it was developed. So I think that's a critical piece in the link of evidence as you tie things together. So, uh, and you know, this is, it's been about 1967 to 97, once that's almost 30 years, and nobody still knows where the film was developed. But anyway, that's it, and uh, any questions? Yeah, it was just actually, it's, I just, well, I've actually called you about this, and it, it relates to the, to the hard copy footage. When I shot my comedic video thing, I was at the, uh, the Trees of Mystery, for those of you who saw it, uh, and John Thompson, who was the manager of Trees of Mystery, when I called to ask him if I could interview him, where I'm making a Bigfoot documentary, I, I think I said it was comedic or whatnot. I just mentioned that it was, it was Bigfoot related, and I said, uh, I'm doing this Bigfoot thing, he goes, oh, Bigfoot thing, you want to see one? I go, what do you mean? He goes, well, do you want to see one? In this kind of uplifting humor, and I didn't pursue it, but what's interesting is, as you know, the night before they shot this footage, they were all at the Trees of Mystery with John Thompson, and the topic was Bigfoot. He's referring to Anna Marie Goddard's uh, 40th anniversary playmate for Playboy magazine. That doesn't disqualify her from seeing a Bigfoot. No, I agree. But, I've just pointed but out. Let me, let me just add one brief comment. When I got up to Crescent City, which is quite near where the film was made, one of my first steps was to go talk to the reporter who had contact with these people. The reporter told me I was with these people the same day they got the footage. They never phoned him after the footage was made. And interestingly enough, the first people, the, pe the video pe videotaping people got a hold of was hard copy. And then I asked the reporter, what were these people talking about the night before they got the film? And he said, quotes around this, Bigfoot dominated the discussion. And so I've got, I'm open on it, I've got a lot of questions, but I still think the film in the Redwoods is real. And interestingly enough, I read a lot just about everything. The film was allegedly taken August 28, 1995. Guess what premiered that evening on Fox TV? Alien Autopsy. And guess who was, that's Fox TV, and guess who was making a one hour documentary about this videotape? Fox TV. Question, comment. Yeah, comment is that um, they've admitted to us that they were talking about Bigfoot. Um, what they don't even know is that hard copy called me, and it, it, so just as there's no question that there was some rearrangement here, and they said, we've got this film that's been loaned to us, and would you look at it and give me an opinion? I said, sure. They federal expressed it out, and I looked at it, and I called them, I said, well, it needs to be looked at more, but they said, is it worth pursuing? We don't want to do a show where, you know, where it, if you think it's a hoax. I said, no, it's worth pursuing. It's hard to tell at this point. And so hard copy was actually, if, if there is a hoax, hard copy didn't, you know, they weren't involved in it. Right, I totally agree. And the other point is that um, right now, these people, they're TV people, they have a company called Waterland Productions, they were disappointed with this hard copy, the way it was presented, and they have not used it since, and they have turned down many, tele about five or six television offers. One of them was uh, that universe, uh, what's it called? Strange it? Universe. Yeah, Strange I've, universe. I've been on it, you know. But uh, <laughs> they turned numerous ones down, and they, they, you'll never see it again in this country in that sort of show, and they have turned down probably twenty to thirty thousand dollars worth of income from it and the reason for that they told me is that they want to they want this looked at in a serious scholarly way and they're not going to just let it be used again for, to make money now also uh, to add the that one i just forgot uh, oh anna marie goddard again she wasn't the girl Sweet. with the videotape camera a fellow by the name of Colin Goddard was. There were five people in that motorhome when they got the videotape. Everybody in the motorhome claimed that they saw the subject. Uh, Craig Miller, 
excuse me, Craig Miller is the guy who actually got the videotape, but he's gone somewhat unheralded. Because of Anna Marie Goddard's celebrity, she got quite a bit of publicity. On Thanksgiving 1995, she was on The Tonight Show with Jay Leno. During the commercial, I don't know if you've seen that, but during the commercial breaks, Jay Leno, as usual, was making light of the situation. During the commercial breaks, the stuff you don't see on the TV, I was told by the witnesses that Anna Marie Goddard got pissed off because Jay wasn't taking her seriously or the videotape. So I went down to inter I went to the film site to take some measurements, to look around, to see what I could learn. I was there three days. My next step was to go talk to the reporter. I spent some time with him. He says, uh, I don't know how they could have faked it. I went down and I talked with three of the witnesses down in Laguna Niguel, which is in the Los, An Los Angeles area. And they struck me as just, OK, nothing spectacular. They just told me, this is what happened. But in terms of a claim, what I do, I investigate and I research. Question? Question is, uh, where, okay, if, if the thing, if the suspect was shot, where's the body? That's what I'd like to know. Shot in what? Well, I shot it was shot. No, no, shot with a video <laughs> camera. <laughs> no, yeah, shot, shot, okay, we're cleared up. Shot with a video camera. Mm. My, my question is, uh, okay, with that uh, article you had about the hoaxes, right? Right. Did you ever pursue in talking to the author of that, uh, of that book, Hoaxes? No. I, I was at Larry Bunn's place, and every time I get to somebody's place, I'm immediately in their bookshelves. Many people can attest to that. And I said, what new books are on the market? And I said, hey, look at this book, Hoaxes. And I looked at it, and I said, wow, this is full of shit. <laughs> and I said, you know, maybe the author should get in touch with me. Right, I don't know yeah. But next, any more questions? <coughs> well, there's been some uh, reports in the dense large areas in northern Minnesota that haven't been published. Or previously. Northern Minnesota? Yeah, that haven't yeah. been previously reported. And I, there's about seven in the example of the connection with the hosts. The one, only one I found not to be true. It's an example of how things find their way in the newspaper articles and stories. Then book authors assume because it's in the paper that it must be true, but the newspaper didn't check it out. Right. And one of them uh, reported by Sasquatch running through a house, an unfinished house, you know. And I traced it down and found out that he was a kid just playing a joke. You know? Nothing. Yeah, right. and, exactly. And so, I mean, that's an example of why everything has to be personally checked out. Right. I think. So, I like yeah. to, just like they did with the OJ case, they tore it to pieces, really dug into it. And that's the way I do with the Bigfoot yeah. scenes. It's like someone, <laughs> someone, someone makes a claim in the Bigfoot field, I said, we need to check it out. Not just check it out, but check it out thoroughly. And the same thing when Donald Hepworth met with John Green. John Green made, he was in the house with myself, Hepworth, Green, and a couple of other people. And I know John Green for a little bit, and I noticed that he was very concerned with this quote unquote good report. And he said, either he's seen one or he's a damn liar. Sonny, can, can I say something about John Hepworth a minute? Is, uh, or, or in general, is sure. that we have to be very careful about hearing different details given by the same person, but to different people at different times, sometimes in the newspaper, sometimes to other people, and if it's not coming directly from that source. Now, I've interviewed Hepworth twice, several years apart, and I found no inconsistencies, and he even used some words that, that I don't think we use, like he used the word black people. To him, initially, use the word Negroes, that he thought, my gosh, what are these two Negroes doing here? And I don't think that has come out in other interviews. And all I'm saying is that when one tells a story, you don't always use the exact same words, and when it's repeated by other people, that can get extended even further. So we have to be very cautious, I think, about interpreting the honesty of a witness, unless you yourself, right. as oneself, 
does it directly and not through intermediaries and certainly not through newspapers. Now someone, yeah, my own commentary, I don't know if you agree with me, but if someone like Hepworth were in the courtroom uh, and he was being prosecuted and they were cross-examining <coughs> cross the individual, all of this would come out from the wash and I'm almost certain that that witness would be discredited. There were three brief ones I wanted to make about the genuine that were not that were reported. One was uh, a man that estimated uh, a tree. He saw about half the height of the tree in northern Minnesota, and later he went and measured the height of the tree, and he said the tree was 20 feet high, and that would make it pretty big. Uh, his father also saw a uh, Sasquatch uh, on the Minnesota-Ontario border between the Highway 11 and the Rainy River, and he said it, it looked like almost like a horse's mane, and the hair was just streaming off the back and running. He said, my initial reaction was, this is a man that escaped from the circus, he said. And uh, there's a third one that was really uh, surprising. I don't know if anything has ever happened in parallel to this, but uh, a truck, a pickup truck surprised one in northern Minnesota, and the occupants uh, saw it in study for a while before it saw them. He says, when it turned and looked at him, he said, that he actually looked right in their eyes. He says, I'm sure he was at eye contact. And he said, it looked surprised and amazed that it had been observed. He said, that, like, uh, and so there's all well, just easy and very intently. I don't have all that. I don't know if that's very unusual. I've just been in this three years. <laughs> but I uh, just well, thought I'd share it with you. Great. Uh, no more questions. I need to wrap up in the Mind game. I, uh, hello. More. May I make? Do you mind one more question? Yes, uh, John. Just one. May I make? May I make some points? You mentioned Larry Lund. From first of all, um, the husband of Anna Marie Goddard, if, if I'm not mistaken, He's is driving. Him. Excuse He's me. What? The husband of the model is driving the RV, this and quote, correct. nobody knows where they're going, number one. Um, she had been Playboy, uh, right. uh, a 40-year anniversary, 1994. Do you think, um, because I noticed the creature has straw on its butt, and this comes from Larry Lund, that if right. it was indeed a person in an ape costume that they were sitting waiting by the side of the road, right. and therefore, that's, that's therefore the straw on the uh, anus of this alleged entity uh, represents somebody waiting. If you notice the way the creature walks across the road and then walks back in the other direction as if, hey, look at me, look at me, yeah. and perhaps Anna Marie Goddard did not know that uh, her loving husband was trying to boost her career by giving her national television exposure. And finally, if you could comment on the headlight experiments that you conducted with Larry Lund. Because the headlights of, of the camper are very low to the ground, and if this is an eight feet entity, why is it hidden here, Dan? And why did it when you and Larry, Larry is a shorter man, why did they hit him at the same length? And I don't think Larry's eight feet tall. <laughs> Larry Lund's about five seven. Now, I don't exclude the possibility that it could be a hoax. I'm totally open. I'm very suspicious of the whole thing, the whole situation. It's, it's a very poor case, although I think it's a poor case. I think the subject that you, I think, I don't know, that the subject in the movie is a real Bigfoot. Now, the comment specifically about the headlight experiment, Larry and I were up till 3 in the morning running the tape, running the tape, and just running our mouse. So we went out to my motor home, which is parked at his place. We turned on the headlights, and I think my motor home, the headlights come up to about 28 inches. So what we did is we, where the glare, say if I'm the creature, if the light glare is here, it hits about right here. And I said, Larry, can you and I agree that maybe the center of this light is the center of the light? And he said, OK, about 28 inches. So we went there. We looked at the subject on the television, and I put a post-it note, smack center at that. And then I asked Larry, where do you think the feet are? And he said, about right here. So we said, OK, maybe that's about 28 inches. And I said, well, let's go ahead and just call it three feet, that distance right here, from the headlights to the feet. It's just uh, crude calculations. Then what we did is we took this known measurement and we just flipped it up to the top and then the top came out. So we flipped it up for another three, add another three, so that would be six feet. And it seemed to me in the arc fruit experiment, Larry disagreed with me, that 
it came to about right here. So I'm saying, yeah. But but Dan. The subject is over six feet tall. But Dan, the headlights on the motorhome that they show us in hard copy are low to the ground. Uh, you, of course, yeah, you're not going to run it again. Second of all, don't didn't Anna Marie Goddard have marital problems with her husband? If I was married to somebody like that, I would do anything to keep her as my yeah, wife. That's Indeed, that's driving a motorhome, yeah. not telling anybody in the motorhome yeah. that this was going on. That's the part where he was also beating his mother. No, Mr. Greenwell, I'm not pointing that. I'm asking that I had heard, and maybe you can confirm this, that they did have marital problems prior to that. If they are having marital problems, I'm not keen to it, but I wouldn't be surprised at all. What needed to be done is get the specifications of the army from the, from the factory, which, which we got, and I don't know what, what Danny did, I don't know about this, yeah. but it checked out with us. But I'm, I'm, I'm continuing to pursue it, but I can't take up the, all the time. I understand. We need to go to the next speaker, and uh, I need to boot myself off the stage, and you could ask me questions later. Uh, our next speaker. Enough. If you're enjoying all this rare and unique content, Please show your support by subscribing and leaving comments.